welcome to Dat Mom Talking. Tonight's story is a short but absolutely chilling encounter by my good friend Repulsive Answer 933 over on Reddit No Sleep. As ever, please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. It really does help build the channel and our community further. And why not hashtag Team Fear and DMT's Cryptid Crew. And so, with that aside, let's get into tonight's story. Entitled The Beasts of Brayton Lake. Let's get straight into that. I've always thought that thalassophobia was the most rational fear, as I've always feared the ocean and large bodies of water. Deep, seemingly endless waters unnerve me, and the only place I'd swim or even enter the water would be a pool that I could see the bottom of. But now, everything is different. If the last year has taught me anything, it's that fears need to be dealt with. I'm not limiting myself anymore, and there's no guarantee that tomorrow I won't be rushed inside due to another pandemic. So, this summer, I decided to get over my fear, and to do so, I had become determined that I would swim the width of Breton Lake. It wasn't an enormous lake by any means, but it was fairly big and I wasn't doing it for exercise. It was to be able to show myself that there was nothing to be afraid of lurking under its waters. With the lake's hours having been just prolonged due to the start of summer, I planned to spend more more of my days practicing for my swim. Well, actually, it was less about practicing for the swim itself and more about training my brain not to be afraid of the water. On my first attempt, I barely got in up to my knees. However, I knew that this close to the shore, anything that could feasibly fit in the shallows wouldn't be there due to the commotion I was making. The second time, I got up to my hips, but then something I assume was a fish brushed up against my legs and I sprinted out of the water. Or the first time I got all the way out to where I had to stand on my tippy toes, just to keep my head above water, I felt amazing. I was still terrified, of course, but knowing that I had been able to do this with nothing else but constantly reminding myself there's nothing in the water made me feel in control for the first time in a while. I began to swim towards the shore when I saw him. Standing over my bag, staring at me intently, was a ragged old man in a peach sweater and green waders. He seemed surprised when I yelped in surprise, and when he opened his mouth, his voice was much more jovial and sweet than I would have thought. Hoy, sorry there to frighten you, but I thought you'd been one of them drowners. Good to see you ain't dead. He spoke with a British accent, a strange dialect for someone living in my town, which was in rural Pennsylvania. Before I'd gotten any closer, he backed away from my things and explained that he'd thought I was a corpse of someone who drowned while swimming in the lake. We get quite a bit more of those then, you'd think. It's the beasts what do it. All the trance of fear and confusion he placed over me broke as soon as he had said those words. As I crawled back onto the shore, collected my things and slept my shirt back on, he began to explain the rich history of the lake. He said he worked for a museum in London, a small, somewhat odd exhibit that showcased local urban legends and myths from around the world. He had come to my town, apparently after finding some obscure encounter from the 1800s that had led to more research, eventually finding out that there was a hidden legend of some group of siren-type creatures abiding in our lake. Our different depictions looked more like birds, others had the bottom half of fishes, but each one had one similar aspect. No matter what, the monster would shapeshift to look like a beautiful person in order to lure its prey into the full sense of security. And then it would wrap its body around its victim and pull the poor soul to the lake's floor. And one of those things, or one of its victims, is what Craig had thought I was. That was his name, by the way, Dr. Richard Craig. And I wasn't sure whether I should have taken that as an insult or a compliment. We talked for a while after that, and I explained my fear of the open water, now amplified 
by the legend of some sort of freaky fish person, and my goal of swimming from one side of the lake to another. Well, he loved the idea, which he won't lie, made me proud, and he said he'd bring me out on his boat if I ever wanted to, so I could get a real feeling for the lake. Of course, I agreed as he seemed very personable, and struck me as the opposite of someone who would want to kill you. After another week of me swimming further and further out into the murky waters, I met up with him a few hours after dawn, and we set out on his rotten old crabbing boat. His excuse to go out and waste the morning with me was to check the crab traps, and so while having a lake and all of its history explained to me, I was roped in to working. As we floated along aimlessly, I asked Creek how many times he'd encountered the creatures, and he said he'd only seen a few of them, and most times they just appeared to be corpses floating in the water. My method for getting rid of them is usually just to poke them with a stick, and then turn them over. You see, usually, when they're the creatures, and not the victims, they have their faces down covered by the water. And so I turn them over, and of course, after looking at them, over for any scales or things like that. And if they have anything suspicious, I hook them into the boat and shoot them in the head. They kind of look like mermaids. <laughs> Not the Disney kind. They look like the old Sailor's Tales versions. More fish than human. And sometimes they even look like other marine animals. Hell, once I saw one that looked like a swordfish. But they've got long black hair so dark that it's a bit hard to see where the water begins and the hair starts most of the time. Anyways, I've got a sawn-off shotgun in the back behind you. I use that to put a few holes in them before they scurry back under the waves. I've never actually got to kill one of them. God, I would really like to put that skeleton on my mantle. I sat silent in the boat for a little while. I didn't entirely believe him still, but the matter in which he was talking about these horrible things, as if they were such a regular occurrence that they no longer scared or terrified me. We sailed in silence for a good amount of time and I could see Craig could tell how horrified I was. He started to turn around when he stopped the boat entirely. Look out towards that piling. You see it too? My head snapped up and my mind returned to the boat. Out, in the center of the lake, there was a giant metal structure Craig had told me earlier had been used for military target practice, but that was in the 50s and now he said it was used as a glorified diving board. I looked towards it and quickly a white blot in the black water caught my eyes. It was the top half of a woman floating face and stomach down in the water. And as he pivoted the boat towards the body, Craig motioned for me to get the shotgun. We bobbed closer and closer, my anticipation making me sick, and we saw the thing clearly. Its thick black hair spooled around its still submerged head, but its neck and back well, they were fully visible. It was coated in feathers and scales, the color of pale brown skin, and the thing was twitching, shuddering as if it were crying under the water. Craig held out the shotgun over the side of the boat and poked at the thing. I suddenly got rigid and still, as if we had caught it off guard, as if it didn't know we were that close. He shook me from my transfixed state of horror and acceptance, and urged me to grab the net it stowed in the back of the boat. I stared at him in wild confusion as he looked at me. The net and then back of the thing pretended to be dead in the water. I stood up shakily and walked a few feet towards the net. He handed a shotgun to me after making sure I knew how to use it and took the net for himself. In a flash, he tangled a thing in the net and dragged it into and onto the floor of the boat. We both started screaming as we saw its face and bottom half for the first time. It was a twisted mockery of mermaid, sure. It had the top half of some sort of woman, but had the body of a fish below its waist, and where the leg should be, it flipped a giant black tail. Its face, however, was the worst part, as in the middle of what appeared to be a human visage sat the lure of an angler fish. A long brownish-black cord stuck out over the top of its skull and hung over its more fished and human face, and the tip 
emitted a faint light. I had thrashed violently, desperately trying to escape the boat and sliced at Craig's arms as he grabbed the shotgun from her hands and blew the thing's head to bits. I had slumped forward, slipping off the side of the boat and into the water. It twitched and gurgled as it fell and as it sunk, its black blood mixed with the water. Craig began to speed the boat back towards the shore and I began to cry. My dream of swimming across the lake evaporated in my mind and I passed out. I awoke in Krieg's home, collected my things and left. Lanayat had hardly slept, the image of the monster's head and lure popping replayed endlessly in my mind. It took a while before I was okay going back into the water, and Krieg tried to encourage me not to give up on my goal of swimming the width of the lake. He said that if I would consider doing it, He'd follow me very closely in his boat and would pull me out if anything happened. He only really convinced me when he showed me the rifle and harpoon gun he'd bought for the purpose of protecting himself and I. And so I agreed. The things in the lake seemed easy enough to kill and with the added firepower, it helped to calm my horror. I was still terrified, of course, but I was strangely even more determined to get across the water now as if knowing those terrible things were there only greatened the accomplishment. And so eventually, the day came, and I got prepared to swim across the lake. I was of course terrified, but when looking out across the water with Craig, we couldn't see anything but a deep black water. He started a boat while I stretched and got warmed up, and eventually I waded in up to my chest and began to swim. And Krieg was about a hundred feet from me, slowly trailing behind me, whipping his head back and forth to make sure there were no disturbances beside our wakes. The first few miles went great. I think I felt a fish maybe once, but besides that, the vast, endless steps didn't freak me out too much. I think seeing the creature changed my fear from the open water to those things hidden somewhere in the depths. But even with my fear of them, the constant patrolling from Krieg and the lack of movement quelled my fears for the most part. I suppose that our little incident with the half-angler fish had scared them off for the most part, and I was fine with that. As long as we couldn't see them, I tried not to think about them. I could see the shoreline when it happened. Do you know how cruel and unfair that felt? I could see the shore. My goal was within reach when from out of the murky abyss behind me appeared two scaly and fin-covered backs. And they speeded towards me at unnatural speeds, and quickly they gained on me. Creek pulled out his rifle and fired a few shots that just ricocheted off of them, and I gave him one last pitiful look as the creatures caught up to me. I pulled my eyes tight and waited to feel the cool wet nothing as they pulled me under the waves, but nothing happened. And as I cautiously opened my eyes, I realized that they weren't swimming towards me. All at once, they slammed into Krieg's boat, tearing the metal from its hull. He brandished the harpoon and aimed wildly, but there were too many. And they began to climb the sides of the small boat, their horrible bodies in full view. The one closest to him had less of a fish body and instead had the claws and legs of a crab. Another had tentacles and wrapped its tendrils around my poor friend. We stared at each other for a moment, before he began to scream as they pulled him apart. The tentacles ripping at his skin, and the pincers snipping his body to bits. When they were finished, they took the parts they wanted and started a feast on my friend's remains and tossed the rest into the water. The red and pink of his torn flesh mixed with the water made a terrible brownish mixture. I came to my senses and tried to swim as silently and quickly as I could away from the sinking boat and the pieces of what used to be my friend. As I turned to check that the horrible beasts were still eaten, they turned to look at me, and I saw their faces clearly for the first time. They were beautiful. A deep serenity hid their faces, and it looked as if they were carved out of stone by some wildly gifted artist. And then the beauty was interrupted by their screams, a deep, guttural groan, 
as I realized that they were alerting more of their kind to the chum in the water. The chum being my friend's remains, and of course, me. I swam, never looking back, but I could hear them gaining on me. I nearly reached the shore when one of them swam up beside me, its dark grey dorsal fin sticking out from its back. It made a terrible, sputtering noise as if it was laughing underwater. The terrible creature pulled its head from the blackness as it matched its speed with me. And I swear the freak of nature smiled at me, exposing rows and rows of long, sharp teeth. In a blink, the half-shark, half-human sunk below the waves and trailed behind me, and then suddenly appeared directly behind me and grabbed my leg. It played with it for a moment before digging its teeth into my limb. I screamed, all alone with the monsters, no one to help me, and it let go. A large chunk of my flesh left with the beast, still clutching the torn meat in its jaws. I screamed again as the open wound mixed with the salt water, and I tried to swim as fast as I could. I don't know how I reached the shore. I assumed that they were simply fawn, feasting upon my friend, but whatever it was, I got to the beach and passed out. I woke up to a crowd of people over me, tending to my wounds. I slept for a long time, intermittently waking up in the hospital, assuring the doctors I was still alive. I told them what happened when I was fully conscious, but of course I knew they wouldn't believe me. They chewed up my leg wound to a bull shark, and I gave up trying to convince them of what happened. I'm not afraid of the deep water anymore, just the things inside of them. Wow, 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 wow. Suddenly another one, wow. Short but intriguing and chilling story there. From a good friend, Repulsive Answer 933, over on Reddit, No Sleep. Of course, as ever, a huge thank you, Repulsive, for allowing me to narrate your work on the show. I really did enjoy this story, and certainly look forward to more of your work in the future. Guys and girls, you know the drill. As ever, please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. It really does help build the channel and our community further. And why not hashtag Team Fear and DMT's Cryptid Crew. If you're an aspiring writer or would just like to have a crack of things like myself, then please, please do get in touch with me at the brand new email as on screen, which is contact the dead one at gmail.com. I really look forward to hearing from you. As always, guys, I hope you're having a cracking start to the week, getting stuck in, taking a fight back to life, and enjoying the good summer vibes and bright sunshine. But above all, guys, remember, be safe, not sorry. <laughs>